Amen. Amen. Clap it up for Jesus. Come on, clap it up for Jesus. Judea. When the 100 
and 20 are receiving the Holy Spirit, God sends them a miraculous sign causing them to speak in languages that they did not know. Those Jews who had gathered asked this question, how is it that each of us can hear in our own indigenous or native language, notice what they said, Parthians, Medes, Elamites. That's the area of Persia or modern day Iran. Those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and in Cappadocia, that's Turkey, Pontus, Pontus rather, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, that's North Africa. Visitors from Rome, notice now, both Jews and converts. These were Gentile proselytes to Judaism who went back to uh, Jerusalem in order to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. But then you'll also notice Cretans and Arabs from the Sinai Peninsula. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God. Now, I don't know if you can see this. Maybe I'll try and expand this a little bit. But just to kind of point out, these are the areas in which the early believers, those who were there at Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit, they went back to where they lived. As new believers, here's the areas, Cyrene, Libya, and Egypt, that's North Africa. You see Arabia, right? You see that in the Arabian Peninsula. But then you also notice Phrygia and Pamphylia, Cappadocia and Pontus, that's in Asia Minor, the area that we call Turkey. But then you'll notice that they also went to areas like Parthia, Media, and Elam. That's way east. That's the area that we call Iran. And so you'll also notice that they also went to Crete. All of these areas represented Eastern Christianity. You don't have Western Christianity until you get to Rome. This is Western Christianity. All of this is Eastern Christianity. And for most of Christian history, Eastern Christianity influenced Christianity. And so let's look at a couple of other texts here. There we go. It's kind of moving a little slow. Hang in there with me. Let's look at early Christianity's Asiatic African history. And the reason I say Asiatic African is because Christianity was born on the continent of Africa, but cradled on the continent, I'm, I'm sorry, born on the continent of Asia and cradled on the continent of Africa. The westernization of Christianity is often the focus of church history. But this is a mistake. Christianity has a rich history in Africa, Syria, Persia and India. In fact, there's church history outside of Rome that had councils, theological and doctrinal disputes that we never even read about. Christianity did not begin in Europe. It spread there just as it did in many other parts of the world. So let's walk through it. Let's look at some of the places that it went through. I'm going to try and push through this quickly. Syria. Syria. Now, Syria is just a little northeast of Judea. Paul, when he had his conversion in Damascus, Damascus is in Syria. Antioch, this was one of the major church centers in the early church, there were at least four or five other Antiochs in the biblical period. The main Antioch, the one that scripture is concerned with, 
The largest one is the one in Syria, Antioch of Syria. This is where believers were first called Christians. In Acts 11 and 26. Also, according to historical literature, we know a lot about this church. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch. This was an early second century bishop. Show you how uh, young, I should say, how overlapping his history is with the lives of the apostles. Ignatius was born about 35 or 36 AD. This is about three years after Jesus' death and resurrection. He becomes a bishop in the early part of the second century church and is one of the bishops there at the church in Antioch. Then there's Tatian the Syrian. He's a disciple of Justin Martyr and he was one of the earliest extra-biblical Christian writers. You got Theophilus of Antioch. He also became a bishop there at Antioch and he's one of the earliest apologists. Antioch was the home of a catechetical school or theological school of thought that gathered bishops and presbyters to teach them exegesis and theology. One of the earlier theologians associated with the school of Antioch was Ephraim the Syrian. And then, of course, when you're looking into Syrian Christi Christianity, you've got an area that's just a little further west of Antioch, and that is called Erhoi or Adisa. Adisa became the home to many Syrian Christians, and the fact of the matter is, is, is that it was in Adisa that you find many of the uh, Syriac writings, that, that is the translation of the New Testament from Greek. In fact, the very first translation of the Greek New Testament was in the Syriac language. This is Christianity in the East. According to Eusebius, the uh, 4th century church historian, in his ecclesiastical history, and also a 5th century document called the Chronicles of Edessa, it places Christianity in that part of Syria around the 2nd century A.D. And then we have what we know of the church in Dura Europis. This is a really interesting church. It was planted in the first century and is one of the oldest surviving house churches in history. Around 232 AD, it has surviving frescoes. These are paintings of early Christianity. Uh, paintings of Moses, paintings of the apostles, and among them is the earliest depiction of Jesus. Hold on, it's moving slow, but it's going to move. There we go. Now, this stone right here is a fresco that's called Christ the Good Shepherd. It was found in Dura Europis just above the baptismal pool. So, so we've got, we show evidence even of baptism frescoes showing early believers getting baptized. And here is an image of Christ with a sheep over his shoulder. It's the image called Christ the Good Shepherd. Here's the interesting thing. Here we go. Come on. Bands here. Hold on. Uh oh, I think it might have moved too fast. All right. All right. I don't think it's it's. Let me see what I can do. 
There we go. All right, it's moving a little slowly. There's a little lag, but hang in there with me. So uh, there was a picture, and uh, my apologies, but I wanted to show you the ruins of one of the churches in uh, Dura Europis uh, that they found somewhere around the 18th century. And so you can see the baptismal uh, pool. You can see areas where they actually gathered to learn and teach. It was essentially what they would call a house church. And so there's archaeological evidence for this church there in Syria. But if you go a little further east of Syria, you get into the area of Persia. The gospel reached Persia through the return of Jewish believers returning home from Pentecost. Remember, the Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamites, they were all ethnic Persians. The Jewish community, however, you, you want to ask, well, how did they get there? You know, how did they get there? Well, they got there because many of them never went back to Judea after the Babylonian exile. So many Jews stayed in that area. So these are essentially the descendants of post-exilic uh, Jews from the Babylonian exile. The first extra-biblical literary source for the existence of Persian Christianity comes to us about the mid-2nd century. There's an inscription of Abersius, and in that inscription, he writes about, now he's a Sicilian uh, evangelist, and when he visits this area, he notices that it is abundant in Christianity. Early Christian records also mention that Peter and Thomas preached the gospel to the Parthians. You have Thaddeus, Bartholomew, and Adias evangelized the races of, or the ethnic groups of Mesopotamia and Persia. Mari, a noble Persian convert, succeeded Adias in the government of the Persian Christian communities. This is Christianity outside of even Rome, outside of the West. Syriac documents also indicate that Christians in the Persian territories had some 360 churches. Many martyrs even during uh, the early 3rd century. Uh, what's interesting, uh, Dr. Vince Bantu says this, that during the 2nd and 3rd century, while Christianity lived under frequent waves of persecution, because of course, if you start with Nero, there's about 10 major waves of persecution all the way up to the signing of the Edict of Milan in 313, right? But in Persia, Christians were able to live peacefully throughout the second and all the way up to about the mid-third century without any kind of persecution. So oftentimes, Christians in churches under the Roman Empire would flee to Persia. The East Syriac Christians living in the Persian Parthian Empire experienced a greater degree of peace and autonomy than their fellow Christians to the West. This is what it means, Bantu writes, that in the second and third century, the areas now known as Greece and Italy were more dangerous for Christians than the areas now known as Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Talking about irony. These areas, I mean, these, these are very, very hostile and dangerous areas. But back then, it was safer for a Christian to practice and walk out their testimony and witness of Christ in those areas than it was almost anywhere under the Roman Empire. Syriac documents also indicate that Christians in the Persian territories we mentioned this, had some 360 churches, but by the time of the mid-third century under Shapur II, there was a radical or an intense persecution and thousands of Persian Christians, hundreds, tens of thousands, uh, became martyrs. And so that time of peace kind of came to an end and Christians started experiencing persecution there as well. What about early Christianity in Egypt? First of all, you do know that Egypt is in Africa, right? Yeah. I'm just checking. I'm just, just checking. You know, folks, we're talking about this in the Middle East. Okay. It's in Africa. Christianity in Alexandria, Egypt, dates back to the earliest days of the church. Eusebius, 
Bishop of Caesarea, one of the early church historians in his ecclesiastical history states that St. Mark, this is the writer of the Gospel of Mark, and there's other traditions that support this, first came to Egypt between the first and third year of the reign of the Emperor Claudius, which would put him in Egypt sometime around 41 to 44 AD. That's essentially less than 10 years after, the, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The Copts, the Coptic church in Egypt, have never ceased, according to Elizabeth Assisi, noted African historian and, and theologian, have never ceased to believe that an ancient tradition that St. Mark was the first apostle of Egypt and was martyred in Alexandria. Eusebius also mentions in his church history that an earlier fragment from Clement of Rome refers to Mark's presence in Alexandria. And remember, Clement of Rome, but we'll get to that, Clement of Rome led a school, the Alexandrian school of catechism. So he would have known. He refers to Mark's presence in Alexandria. And then, of course, you've got uh, what you would call pseudepigrapha. These are uh, pseudonymous writings that were named after notable persons in church history called the Acts of Mark, written in Greek around the late 4th and early 5th century, claiming that Mark preached in Serene, that's northern Africa, Libya, and was, watch this, a Serenian Jew. Somebody tell, tell somebody that Mark was an African. Alexandria, Egypt was we just mentioned this. Remember, we had the catechetical school in uh, Antioch. Well, Alexandria had one. It was a little bit even more formal. And um, it was the home of many theologians, philosophers, and Christian scholars. By catechesis, I'm referring to the process whereby they were trained and discipled and taught the word of God. It was led by two early church fathers who were also noted theologians and apologists. Clement of Rome, who was born in Athens around the mid-2nd century, taught at the school around 190 AD. This is the end of the 2nd century. He was succeeded by Origen, who was born of mixed Egyptian and Alexandrian Greek parentage. He grew up a Christian and became the first major thinker of the early church. He led the school around 231 to 232 AD. He led the school right around the time of a major wave of persecution in North Africa that I'm going to get to uh, shortly. What else was happening on the continent in Africa? Uh, it was Tertullian who said that the the, the the blood of the martyrs was the seed bed of Christianity. In other words, the more Rome attacked Christians in North Africa where they were a plenteous, the church just grew. It exploded in growth. And so on Egypt, uh, in Egypt, you had, as you would expect, wherever Christians are, you're going to find some good things going on, but you're going to find some problems too. Well, there was a problem in the early church called the problem of the lapsi or the lapse. This was a problem of persecution whereby many believers wishing to escape persecution would denounce Jesus in order to avoid being killed. Then they would go back to church where two or three other folk from the church had been arrested and been killed and then want to be accepted back into fellowship. So there was problems with people wanting to worship with people who lacked courage, who didn't want to die for their faith. So there were questions about that. And, and this issue only intensified when leaders were lapsing in their faith and then wanting to come back and preach. Can you imagine that, Pastor Ken, you know, just, 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 just becoming a coward. <laughs> and, and, and instead of him 
offering for the name of Jesus, he presents what they would call a sacrificati or a certificati, which is really just a, a pass to say, hey, you know, I, I've sacrificed to the gods and, and I've got my certificate saying that I've also bowed down to the emperors. Some Christians were so slick that they would get their uh, empathetic neighbors to pose as them to go down and get the certificate for them so that whenever they were stopped, they could just pull out their pads and say, got the certificate. So when bishops started doing that, it became a problem. So Peter, a bishop of Alexandria, was pretty lenient on allowing them to come back into the church. But his suffragan or his the bishop's assistant named Meletius, which is what the schism was named after, had a problem with that. He felt like these folk had committed the unpardonable sin. Uh, uh, Meletius felt like there was no forgiveness. And he was his issue was that they had fallen away, they had essentially denounced Christianity, and at the very least, they were essentially uh, disqualified from leadership. And that began a controversy. It's also known in another area as the Donatist controversy. But in Egypt, it started splitting churches over the issue. But I'm just showing you Christianity's presence in Africa. But another issue arose sometime around 318, the Arian controversy, where Arius, who had been a elder or a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt, started like, you know, false teachers do, getting, you know, a private revelation. They, they came up with their own interpretation of scripture. And Arius thought that when Paul said to the Colossian church that Jesus is the prototokos, that is the preeminent or the firstborn, he thought that Jesus was the first created, the first of God's creation, that he had a beginning. Arius was so slick with it that he actually even made hymns and he taught it to people in Alexandria. And the song, which can be found today, was called, There Was a Time When Christ Was Not. Folk walking around in the Navy yard singing, There Was a Time When Christ Was Not. <laughs> singing the jingle. Because you know that's how bad theology gets passed along. Oceans and stuff like that. <laughs> I know I'm messing with somebody. <laughs> Some good theology gets passed along through songs too. Christ alone, cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. That's good theology. But Arius' theology made it into songs that actually popularized the, the heresy and he was confronted by Bishop Alexander of Alexandria at a council or a synod in Africa over the issue of the Trinity and he was excommunicated. Here's the, here's the salient point. Long before folk in Europe was ever talking about the Trinity, it was already being defended in Africa. And so Bishop Alexander had him excommunicated, but Arius had some friends in high places. Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia was a relative of Constantine. So Eusebius of Nicomedia convinces Constantine because he sees that there's a growing problem over this issue and he convinces him to convene an ecumenical council in an area of Turkey closer to Bithynia called Ah, just trying to see if y'all awake. Nicaea. And so they meet there and they have a major debate. Bishop Alexander of Alexandria opposes Arius first, we mentioned this, at the Synod of Alexandria where he condemned him. But at the Council of Nicaea, there were essentially three parties. Bishop teams up with one of his deacons. Because see, in the early church, everybody knew scripture. 
everybody was set for the defense of the gospel. You know, deacons didn't just have keys and that's it. Put the chair down in the middle of the floor and, oh, Father. No, no, no. Deacon Athanasius was a pit bull for biblical orthodoxy. So Bishop Alexander was like, I need that man on my team. Now, according to tradition, there were 318 bishops, all from the East, mostly, except for essentially what historians might guess at about three to five bishops from the West, which essentially meant that most of the bishops present, at least 314 to 15, were all from Eastern Church. Here's the issue right here, and I'm moving quickly. There were three parties at Nicaea. First of all, Christianity wasn't invented at Nicaea. The Bible was not invented at Nicaea. Let's get all that straight. Because you know, the folk who say that kind of stuff have never read church history. They're just unintelligently and ignorantly regurgitating and repeating what they heard somebody else say. But there's enough history from this period that serves as primary evidence to help us know who was there. We even know the names of the bishops that were there. We know where they came from, where they served, and we know all of the issues there. Now, the three parties, because this was an issue over the deity of Christ. The idea of the Trinity was already a foregone conclusion for them. Arius, we said, believed that Christ was of a different substance. Therefore, he wasn't really God. He was God-like. And so he argued that Jesus was heterousius, that is, of a different substance. Well, bishop, the African bishops, now there was a Spanish bishop there too, Hosius of Cordoba. They pulled a Spanish brother in there. <laughs> Shout out to all the Puerto Ricans and the Dominicans and got Hosius of Cordoba and the anchor man, Deacon Athanasius, and they argued that Christ was homoousius of the same substance. Because he is. There's only God, God is one. He's only one substance. Now, Eusebius of Caesarea, who was an Orthodox Trinitarian, only disagreed with the usage of the term. He didn't really disagree with them. He didn't like the term, and the reason he didn't like the term is historians tell us that a hundred years earlier, the modalists were using the term homoousius to say that God the Father and God the Son were really the same person. So Eusebius was like, well, I don't really want a Arius to get a leg up in the debate, so I would prefer a different term, something that doesn't associate us with heretics. So he preferred the term homoiousius or similar substance. At the end of the day, these two parties actually agreed, but this party won out, which is why today we have the Nicene Creed and then later the revised Athanasian Creed. Interestingly, about five years, uh, about three years after that, Bishop Alexander of Alexandria died and Athanasius succeeded him as bishop. You know what Athanasius got for standing up for the truth? Constantine exiled him five times. Five times. And the interesting thing is, is that it caused the early church to actually give Athanasius a name which is very similar to the shirt around the Detroit, Detroit versus everybody. The name that they gave Athanasius was Athanasius Contramundo, Athanasius against the world. I'm gonna get that on a t-shirt. But he was a faithful theologian and defender of the faith. 367 in his Easter or festal letter he names all 27 of the New Testament books. 
and calls them the fountainhead of our faith. And then mentions other books that he considered to be helpful and devotional, but not canonical. Athanasius, great African brother. I'm moving quickly here. Everybody ought to know about this guy. He's an Egyptian. His name was Shenuti of a tree, or Shenuti the Great. He's considered one of the greatest writers in history, and one of the reasons for that is this: most of the theologians, if they were in the, if they were in the East, they wrote Greek. They wrote in Greek, and if they were in the West, they wrote in Latin. These were essentially the classical languages of the time. Greek was still the lingua franca, and Latin was a more prestigious kind of writing language. But here, we've got African thinkers and theologians from the 4th century and early 5th century that are writing in the indigenous languages of Coptic. He wrote dozens of sermons and theological treatises and even apologetic texts refuting pagan Egyptian practices. You know what I ask these so-called uh, comedic folk when they be trying to push Egyptology and this, that, and the other. If, if, if Egypt pagan mythology was all of that, why did native Egyptians who grew up with it look at it, look at the gospel, and then turn to Christ? And then some dude from Biloxi, Mississippi is trying to resurrect Egyptian pagan mythology as though it's that great when Egyptian born folk from that period looked at it, knew it, was born with it, grew up with it, and knew that it could not compare to the claims that the church and the gospel had made about the one true God, Jesus the Christ. <laughs> Comedic folk are really asleep, they're not really woke. I owe my brother Mike for that one. <laughs> he was a champion of biblical orthodoxy. Here's another name you should know. Now I'm almost done. You know, black preachers got about three closings. <laughs> this is the first closing now. I'm telling y'all. I'm telling you. I didn't warn them. <laughs> Detroit, seven mile. And telegraph. <laughs> this is Tertullian. Born in North Africa. Not from the south side, from the north side. Modern day Tunisia. Tunisia. Carthage, North Africa. He's often called the father of Latin Christianity because he wrote in Latin. But he's an indigenous African, wrote extensive theological and apologetic works. Uh, you may know of some of them against Praxius, where he wrote against the heresy of modalism. That's modern day oneness Pentecostalism. He was the first of the early fathers, the Latin fathers, to use the term Trinitus. He literally, systematically develops. He doesn't invent the doctrine of the Trinity. He theologically develops it by language in order to clarify what the early church always believed. So we got to get that straight. He doesn't invent it. He clarifies it. Tertullian had been a lawyer. It is said 
by uh, theologians that he introduced into Christian lexicon or dictionary some 500 words. Trinitus was one of them, the Latin phrase for Trinity, where he explained that there is one God eternally existing in three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, uh, co-existent, co-eternal, and consubstantial of the same substance. That's a bad brother right there. He even, he even, in his articulation of the Trinity, coined the phrase, una substantia trace personae. That is, one substance, three persons. This phrase would come in handy later at the Council of Nicaea. It's a bad brother. Come on. Here we go. Most of y'all know about this brother right here. Augustine, where does he look like he's from? He looks like he's from Brooklyn, right? <laughs> Born in modern-day Algeria. Probably the most influential Christian theologian outside of Paul. Wrote extensive systematic theological works and sermons. If you ever have at least a couple of years to spare, go ahead and read The City of God. <laughs> Notice I said if you got a couple of years to spare. Because it's, it's at least, what is it, about a thousand pages at, at the very least. Where people say, hey man, you ever read The City of God? I'd be like, yeah, yeah. I read it. Yeah. <laughs> the clip note version. <laughs> His doctrine of election and predestination influenced the Protestant Reformation more than any other theologian. So you don't have a Protestant Reformation. You don't have the, the developed theology of Martin Luther or of John Calvin or any of the Protestant uh, reformers without this man. They quoted Augustine of Hippo so much that they nearly plagiarized him. So in fact, the Protestant Reformation owes its debt to African theologians. Now, I'm not trying to put a black face on Christianity. What I'm trying to do is reverse the whitewashing. Because when you go to seminary, you never knew that these guys were African. Oh, you ought to know about these two. These two lived during the same time as Tertullian in the same area of um, Carthage, North Africa. Tunisia. Vivia Perpetua and her servant or slave, Philistus. These were, this is a phenomenal story here. These were what you would call catechumen. That meant that they were pre baptized Christians. In the earliest days of Christianity, we can see it in the book of Acts. When you placed faith in Christ, you were saved or born again, they, they were very urgent about baptizing you. What, you know, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized like right now? <laughs> Wasn't no changing clothes and getting into, no. What hinders you to be baptized right now? Early church didn't play about that baptism. Not that they believed it saved you, but they were urgent about it. Early church grew up, though, <laughs> because after a while, they started noticing folk who were making confession for Christ and baptizing, getting baptized, were kind of not really walking in sanctification. <laughs> so they developed a catechism. This was a three-year period where you were not only demonstrating and walking out your sanctification and your faithfulness to the Lord, but that you were 
also walking through uh, doctrinal and theological teachings and all of these different things. After three years, then you were baptized. It was called catechism. So a pre-baptized Christian was a catechumen. Didn't mean that they weren't saved. It meant that the early church held off baptism until you proved that you were saved. Wasn't none of that talking about Jesus today and then, you know, five months later, you know, it's back with your old buddies again. No, no, they, they, you have to prove it. So these two had been in a Bible study where their Bible study had been uh, government officials in Africa had run up into the Bible study and arrested their entire Bible study group. Vibia Perpetua and Philisetus were in prison and she was, watch this, the first diarist in antiquity. That means she was the first person in history to record a diary. An African sister. Long before Anne Frank, she recorded her time in prison, even wrote about when her father came up. Now, watch this. She was a new believer and a new mom, had a, had a baby that was under a year old, and her father pleaded with her to just worship, bow down to the emperor, show loyalty to the God in order to save me from grief. And what about your baby and your brothers and sisters? And she told her father, she said, you see this candle right here? It was a candle in her cell. And he said, yes. She said, what kind of purpose does it serve? And he said, to give off light. He said, she said, well, that's my purpose. And I'm going to give off that light until my light is extinguished. They carry her, Philisetus, and the other Bible study members, the other Christians, into an arena in Carthage, where the first thing they let out was a leper. A leper. Leper tore them nearly to shreds. Her diary, which had been picked up by another faithful member of the church, wrote posthumously after her death, what she did. They said, after the leopard attacked her in Philisetus, she stood straight up, lifted her hands to God, and then went and picked Philisetus up. Then they let out a bear and other animals. And lastly, when she just wouldn't die and would not stop worshiping God, they sent out a gladiator who was so convicted by her courage put the sword up to her neck and wouldn't even slice her throat. She had to grab the sword. And then we got folk who've been in the way for 20 years and 30 years. This was a three, less than three years in the faith. Persecuted and martyred under the emperor's spirits in an arena. Carthage, North Africa. It's my second close, y'all. <laughs> I'm winding it up. You got, you got an organ in Hammond B3? <laughs> hoot triggers. I need hoot triggers. <laughs> what about an Ethiopian? I'll run through this real quick. Remember, this is 4th century, same time period leading up to the Council of Nicaea, but earlier than that. In 316, Syrian Christians, remember we talked about Syria, right? Two brothers and their uncle, uh, Frumentius and Odysseus, they're Syrian Christians. They're on a ship with their uncle down the Red Sea, heading towards essentially uh, Aksum Empire, which is... Nubia and Ethiopia, that region. Historians don't know what happened, but perhaps they had violated some maritime uh, treaty and ended up in waters that they should not have been in. Long story short, when they docked, the Ethiopians 
killed everybody on the ship except for these two Syrian Christians, Fermentius and the Decius. Now, as the Holy Spirit would have it, because it's, a, it's one thing to read about the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church in the book of Acts, but it's another thing that we read church history so we can continue to follow the footprint of the acts of the Holy Spirit in the early church. And as the Holy Spirit would have it, as the sovereign God would have it, these two were the only two who survived. Is that by chance, y'all? I'm going to show you what else God did. They were brought into the home of the king of Axum. Because they were so intelligent, they became tutors in math and science and grammar to the king's sons, Azana and Sazon. However, not only do they tutor them, but they disciple them. They share the gospel with them. And at a very early age, Azana and Sazana come to know Jesus. In 327, the king of Axum dies, and Azana, the oldest boy, becomes the king. As a result of him becoming the king, he makes Ethiopia the first official Christian nation in history. He was the first of any world leader to engrave the sign of the cross on their currency. Look at how God planted these young men in such a significant place to share the gospel with, and Sazana succeeded Azana and he too became king. Now, we also know about this because Azana wrote about it. It was uh, very normal for kings to leave their legacy behind in writing. So we have that exists to this day the Azana stone and the Azana stela which actually tells the story of him hearing the gospel, becoming a Christian, getting discipled, and becoming king, and also making Ethiopia the first Christian nation. It's all written on the Azana stone and the Azana stale, the entire history. In 356 A.D., Athanasius, who had become the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, makes Frumentius, the one who shared the gospel with Azana and Sazana, makes him bishop of Ethiopia. He is traditionally identified as Abba Salam, the first apostle of Ethiopia. And I'm closing. In the seventh century, in the seventh century, this is around the time of the rise of Islam, the seventh century, when Islam first broke out, they only had a handful of converts, roughly about 70, and very reminiscent of what Jacob did when he split his family up running from Esau. What Islamic historians often don't tell you about the first flight or the Hijra, they didn't go from Mecca to Medina right away. They went from Mecca to Ethiopia. A king who was a Christian by the name of Negus. That was a title for an Abyssinian or an Ethiopian king. Gave refuge to these 70 Muslims. All the way up to the point where members of the Chorus tribe ran after them all the way up to the borders of Abyssinia and King Negus, where Negus gave them refuge. The next time you run into a Muslim, tell them that it was Christianity that saved Islam. Which is the reason that when Islamic conquerors went into Africa conquering by sword, they never went back to Ethiopia to do that. Ethiopia remains till this day the only uncolonized nation in Africa. This is the 7th century. 
Now, I'm done on this. This is the third and final close. No, this is it. This is it. And I want to answer this question because the question comes from the folk who, after hearing all that, say, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, all right. Christianity was in Africa, you know, over in North Africa and over in East Africa. But what about West Africa? Where, where our descendants, ancestors rather, came from. What about West Africa? And they come up with all this stuff about they got on the slave ship Jesus and that was the first time they ever heard about this Jesus guy and, and, and you know, they were mostly all Muslims and all this stuff. Christianity they didn't learn about it until they got over here and learned it from the white man. Well, we're going to put a nail in that coffin. <laughs> when do we know that the Portuguese and even the French slave traders went to West Africa and slave trade began? When was that, roughly? Right, 17th century. 17th century. Let's rewind and go back almost 300 years before that. In the 14th century, in the 1300s, in an area of West Africa known as Mali, there was the richest and one of the most powerful African rulers in history named Mansa Musa. You ever heard of him? He was a Muslim. Now, an Islamic scholar and historian by the name of Ibn al Duwadari, Dawadari rather, wrote to King Mansa Musa, and you have to thank for translating this Dr. Vince Bantu, who translated this from Arab into Arabic rather into uh, English. This is what Ibn al Dawadari wrote to King Mansa Musa of Mali regarding Christians. He said, I asked the king of Takur, this was what the area was called, how is the description of the place where gold grows with you? Mansa Musa replied, it is not in that part of our land which belongs to the Muslims, but in the land of the Christians of Takur. So in West Africa, Benin, Nigeria, all that area, in the 14th century, were black Christians, according to Mansa Musa, who has no skin in the game to lie about their presence. Oh, but it gets even better. When Al Dawadari asked him, well, why don't you just take the land by conquest? You know the way Muslims always do. This is what Mansa Musa, King Mansa Musa, replied. He said, if we conquer it and take it, and we've done that before. It does not produce anything. But when we return it back to the Christians, it starts producing gold again. Y'all ain't Pentecostal enough for me. When we took it away from them, gold stopped growing. But when we gave it back to the Christians, the land started producing gold again. Y'all y'all, ain't excited enough for me. Come on. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adores him. What a mighty God we serve. These are those African angels that Paul the White must have been talking about. I'm done, y'all.